Good Sunday morning. Welcome to everybody uh, for our Bible class. Um, you're at home. Uh, there's probably four or five here in the auditorium at this time, but that's what we do during the era of the uh, pandemic. So we hope that you and your family are staying safe. Uh, I would want to mention one thing. This is the uh, Sunday before uh, the, the Christmas uh, time the, coming up this weekend. And I uh, thought I'd mention that I read a news article the other day that uh, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be in conjunction um, starting tomorrow, December 21st. And what that means is they're going to be so close together, it's going to be hard to tell them apart. And so they have anecdotally called that the Christmas star because it's the brightness. And you can see it with the unaided eye, or if you use binoculars or telescope, you might be able to see them apart. But that might be a fun little thing to mention because it only comes around, uh, I think the last time it was seen was like 400 years ago. So it doesn't come around all that often. Uh, so this might be something if um, you're looking uh, up in the skies and you see a brighter than usual star that uh, we don't know how God created the, uh, the Christmas star. Uh, he may have used several planets in alignment, and if he wanted to do that, then okay. But I do think it's interesting that, uh, that uh, even people that might not be believers in God are, are terming this the Christmas star, so I thought that would be something interesting. So before we get into our study of uh, 1 Samuel, if you would please uh, bow with me. And then we will uh, begin in prayer, and then we're going to be in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4. So if you'd pray with me, please. Father, at this time of uh, the, the Christmas season, we're reminded of the greatest gift that you gave us. And Father, we ask that uh, worldwide, as, as people, uh, worldwide, look at this time, that they don't focus on Santa, but that they do focus on Jesus and the gift that you gave. Father, we as believers, we celebrate Jesus in our life every day, and for that gift we're grateful. We hope that we live our lives in appreciation of the gift and the hope of salvation that you gave us through the bringing of your messenger, Jesus, your son. But Father, is this world of peace, we ask that you would kind of continue to permeate uh, uh, all of the people of, of, of our world with a sense of your presence and a sense of your bounty and a sense of your generosity a sense of your peace, a sense of your goodness, and a sense of your wanting everyone to seek after you. Father, as we study uh, this uh, passage in 1 Samuel, we pray that our, our minds will be open to hear what you have to say and that, our, that we will really be able to uh, have a deeper understanding of what went on uh, thousands of years ago in the life of Samuel and the Israelis and that we can find some applications to that today. And it's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7 today. Um, now there's going to be some interesting things that we're going to be looking at and talking about. And so we're going to start with a little bit of the history because this section is called the story of the ark. And it's like it's a self-contained um, story that's just inserted into the uh, uh, the, the writing of the book of 1 Samuel. And it, it really has some very interesting uh, aspects to it. So hopefully we'll touch on some of those and uh, maybe I'll be able to convey a little bit of information to you, but it will also spark a little bit of uh, independent study on your own to kind of seek out a little bit more deeply what the scripture is saying here. So let's talk a little bit about the history of what's going on with the ark with all of this. Well, go back to when uh, the children of Israel were being led by Moses uh, to uh, Mount Sinai uh, out of Egyptian captivity, and they were camped, and they had all of the 12 tribes. And in this graphic, you see that in the center is going to be the tabernacle and the, and the place where people will be worshiping God at the base of the mountain. And, and the three, 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 and three wings, those are the 12 tribes. And the tribes were to encamp in certain places. Some were to the west, some to the north, east, and west. And they would, they would be camping as tribes in these areas, with the focal point being the area of worship. Now, at this time, they didn't really have an area of worship, but Moses did um, uh, bring that message down from Mount Sinai to the people on what that would look like. And so what he said, God said, he says, I want you to build me a place where I will be, and this is going to be the tabernacle. 
So that's kind of, this is an artist's description, a depiction of what the tabernacle looks like. It's a, it's a large enclosed area with, with uh, linen cloths all the way around with posts that were set up whenever they would move. It, it was designed to be portable because you remember during this time, the children of Israel would be wandering for all these years and they would set up camp and one of the things they would set up uh, was the tabernacle. And the tribe that was designated to do all the setting up was the tribe of Levi. And we kind of talked about that a little bit last week, that the Levites were the ones who were the, the, the overseers of all of the aspects of the worship. But uh, within that, you see that there's a place in the middle where they, there's, they offer sacrifices. And then the big structure inside is going to be uh, the moving into the Holy of Holies, where there would be uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, you see the, the, the pillar of smoke that uh, the presence of God would be there during the day and at night it would be a pillar of fire. So part of the tabernacle, um, um, uh, the, uh, some of the, the things that they would use in the tabernacle, you have the, the, the candlestick, uh, which the, the Jews today call the menorah. You have the laver, which is the, the, the bowl where the priest would wash themselves, and you have the, a place where they would, um, an, an altar where they would uh, do the sacrificing of the, uh, of the sheep and the bulls and the lambs and everything like that. And those were some of the implements. You see, they were made of gold. They were some. But there was also one that was not necessarily from Raiders of the Lost Ark that we do, but it was called the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was a special place. It was where they would keep certain things. And it wasn't big. It was about, you know, about six feet uh, long, you know, about you know, two or three feet high, about, about four to six feet long and, and wide had a lid on it and it had the cherubim and those are the, the angelic creatures that are up on top of it. Uh, it was carried by poles that nobody could touch it. Uh, to carry it around, they would slide the poles through those rings and they would then lift up the poles and carry it because no one was allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. But inside the Ark, what they were to place, and Moses did, uh, some manna from the wilderness wanderings, uh, Aaron's rod, that's what, the one that budded uh, and did the, the miracles in Egypt, and then the, t the Ten Commandments. And they were inside the Ark, and that was closed and sealed and everything like that. So, you know, this is where, you know, Indy says, oh, we're going to find that and it's going to be great. And the thing is, literally today, nobody does know where the ark is. So it's one of those long, lifelong mysteries. So if you have a, uh, a, uh, a, a, if you're making a tick list of things to ask God, you know, when you get to heaven, you know, and you're wandering around heaven's streets and you have an opportunity to visit, you say, okay, so where's the ark? Where, where did that end up? And that may be one of the things that you might want to ask. The interesting thing about the ark is the ark was the holy place. It, it was the center. It was the complete apex between heaven and God and the children of Israel. Right at that crossroads between the heavenly uh, presence and the earthly presence, right in the middle of that at this time was the ark. And this is where God says, this is where I will meet with you, and I will speak with you, and I will visit with you. And this was kept in the Holy of Holies. And the only person that was allowed to go in there was the high priest. And the high priest was the one that was designated to be the, um, the conveyor of the messages you know, from God with all this. So during this time... Uh, the tabernacle, which was that more portable place, and, and where the ark was, was in a town called Shiloh, which is about 20 miles north of uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem wasn't the center, as we've talked about. Shiloh was up north. Eli was the high priest, and he was the judge, and uh, it was, it, Shiloh was the, the place where, where the ark would reside with everything. So that's a little bit of the background of what's going on with the ark, the power of the ark, and what all that does with everything. Well, we're going to be talking about, uh, there in verse 1, Israel went out to battle with the Philistines. So let's talk just a little bit about the Philistines. Philistines, they think, and they have pretty good, um, they, they've done a lot of DNA um, uh, research over the years, which is really fun. Uh, and they've, they've figured out that the, the people on the, uh, on the western coast of Israel, who are not the Jewish people, but descendants of the Philistines, 
the, they share DNA with people from um, the Aegean Sea area, uh, Greece and, and all of that. And the, the oral history before DNA came around was that yes, the Philistines were sea people that came from uh, Greece and they, they settled in along the coastline of, of, of Canaan in that area. And they, they kind of settled there and uh, uh, started taking on some of the, um, uh, the Baals gods and the Asheroth gods. But they also brought their own god, which was Dagon. And Dagon was kind of the sea god with all this. So they've, uh, they, they brought with them some of their culture and some of their perspectives, but also some of their sense of, of conquering with everything. Uh, metallurgy, they were good in, in making uh, metal things, and so um, uh, weaponry and uh, tools, implements, farming with all of this. So um, a couple of their main cities were on a north-south um, uh, passageway, uh, market road between Egypt and Turkey, and so there was a lot of commerce with all of this. And so these people, they were kind of wanting to move a little bit east. And east of where they were at the Mediterranean was where all of the, it's where all of the Israelis were with all of their land. So there was this back and forth and the boundary kept kind of moving uh, between them over, over the, the years. Uh, when the children of Israel first came into the land with uh, Joshua, they pushed all these people out to the borders and they, they kept that central land. Well, over the intervening years, those people would grow and they would start to push back against the Israelis. So there were some battles with all of this. So what we have is that the Israelis decide that they're going to attack the Philistines and they're gonna move over from the Shiloh area in, in the, that central area of Israel. They're gonna go west and they're gonna attack the, the Philistines and they end up, you know, it's, they, they lose. They lost 4,000 people. Look there in verse 2. Philistines drew up in line against Israel. When the battle spread, Israel was defeated, who killed about 4,000 men in the field of battle. And so when the people came to the camp, in verse 3, this says, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? We know. Let's get the ark, because the ark of the covenant is going to help us and save us from the power of our enemies. Now, we remember that from, from Joshua, that uh, uh, the Battle of Jericho, that they would march around the city of Jericho and carry the ark, and the ark was, was prominent with all of that. And there was a sense in the book of Numbers that basically Moses said, you know, where the ark is, that their enemies will flee. So there was a little bit of uh, history in possibly the ark being the presence of God, that that would uh, scare a lot of the Philistines with all of this. Now, one thing that's interesting here is that, uh, and, and this may be one of the reasons for the defeat, it's not mentioned in scripture, but we can infer it from other aspects of scripture, that when the people entreated to God as to what they should do, and God said, go up and slay the enemy, that they kind of had an endorsement and a mandate from God to do so, do so. And generally they would have victory. We don't have any indication here in the scripture that the people appealed to God whether or not going up against the Philistines was a good idea in the first place. Could very well be that they had started getting complacent and a little bit, you know, cocky in what they're doing and, and all this kind of said, well, you know, we don't like the Philistines encroaching, so let's go and let's push them back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody kind of got up, but they did not ask God. Again, I think if they had asked God, God would have made sure that that part was included in Scripture. Since it's not, I think we can infer that they decided to do this without God's endorsement. So they were defeated, and they said, well, let's get the ark, and let's bring it from Shiloh, and it's about 20 miles to where the battlefield was, almost, almost due, due west of Shiloh toward the, the Mediterranean Sea. So as they brought the ark, Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of, of Eli, you know, they were the primary caretakers because at this time, Eli was 98 years old and pretty much blind, really overweight, probably had gout in his feet or something. He, he couldn't move very well or see very well, but he was like the elder statesman. But he couldn't go into battle. So Hophni and Phinehas uh, took this into battle. And that's what we have there in verse 4. 
Uh, the two sons of, Hophni, of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant came into the camp, Israel gave a mighty shout, Yay, the Ark is here. And the Philistines are sitting there going, what, What's that mighty shout? What does that mean? And they say, so the spies, they said, Well, they've got the Ark. And they went, Whoa. Literally, they did. Look at verse 7. A God is coming to the camp, and they said, Woe to us. For nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. They're basically saying this isn't good. Because, look at what they say, the very next line. These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Now that happened about 375 years earlier than this time. So the Philistines were aware of what the ark may have meant and what the God of the Israelis that are being brought into battle, the symbol of that, might have meant. The, the, the Israelis are bringing their idol, think of the mindset from the Philistines, because Dagon was their God and they had an image, and so they assumed that the Israelis' image of their God was the ark. So here comes the ark into the battle, and they go, whoa, this is not going to be good for us. So what they decide, in verse 9, they said, take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. And they did, and they fought against the Israelis, and 30,000 Israelis were killed. And the ark of God was captured by the Philistines. That's number two bad. And then number three, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. So this was just a disaster all the way across the board. And I think the, what I'm reading into that is maybe the mindset of the Israelis at this time were not as focused on God. And we can see that because we've talked about how Hophni and Phinehas were kind of um, making a, a, a type of a mockery of, of worship to God through the sacrifices and the way that they did things and managed that. And I don't think God was very pleased. And the arrogance, I think, at this time of the Israelis that say, well, God is on our side, so let's get the ark, because the ark is really going to seal the deal. And God said, well, I don't think so. And sure enough, it didn't happen that way. And there's a lot of calamity that happened this day. Hophni and Phinehas were killed. Uh, we can assume, wouldn't it be nice to assume that they were defending the ark as opposed to turning tail and running for their own lives, which probably would have been more in character. Uh, but they were killed. The ark was captured. The symbol, the, the, the theocratic symbol of the nation of Israel was in enemy hands, in pagan hands. It was no longer in their hands. This is the first time they've lost the ark since Mount Sinai. And these are the people, it was on their watch. So there's a lot of things that are going on here that speak to the, the intent and the purpose, I believe, of the Israelis at this time being a little bit haughty and arrogant with, with thinking that they were invulnerable with this. Well, here's the battle, and this guy, there's this one guy that, uh, that kind of running back. Look in verse um, uh, 15. Eli was 98 years old. His eyes were set so that he could not see. And a man hurried and came and told Eli from the battlefield, How did it go? Eli said. What's the shout? It's really interesting. Because um, he says... Um, uh, verse 14, when Eli heard the sound of the outcry of this messenger, he says, what is this uproar? Which is interesting because that's basically what the Philistines said when the ark came in. What is this big noise? What's this big shout? Well, now here's Eli kind of repeating. What is this big noise going on with all this? Tell me. And so the man told him, he says, uh, your two sons, uh, two things. Verse 17, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There's been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark has been captured. Interesting phrase here in verse 18. You ready for it? As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of his gate. His neck was broken and died, for the man was old and heavy. Okay, big guy, old, 
fell, broke his neck, and he died. But it's interesting that it, this did not happen at the announcement of the death of his sons. It was announced at the, at the mention of the Ark of God being captured. Like I said before, I think Eli's heart was always in the right place, always a good guy. I just don't think he had the, 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 the weight, the gravitas to really keep his children and the nation centered and focused in a really healthy way that would seek God. I think he was a very devout man personally as a manager as a leader, probably not so. And it was significant to me that when he lost, when he heard about the ark being gone, that this is what literally tipped him over the edge. So he died. He had says, Scripture says there in verse 18, he judged for 40 years. P.S., I'm not going to spend time on this. Phineas' wife was pregnant at the time. She went into shock, went into premature labor, gave birth to a kid, said, call his call his name Ichabod, because the glory has departed. Look in verse 21. The glory has departed from Israel, and then she died. Okay? So the family is, is God's, God's prophecy that, that Eli's family is going to be taken care of as far as they're going away. And, and again, we're seeing more of the prominence of Eli diminishing, and then Samuel's going to be increasing here. So pretty much in one day, we have Hophni, Phinehas, their dad, Eli, and Phinehas' wife uh, all dying as part of that family clan. Okay? So this is not good. So the, the, the nation of Israel is, is reeling from this. Now, there, there's something that's interesting here that's not really said, but I'm going to say it now, and it'll make sense a little bit later on. It's possible that in the rout of the war, that the Philistines pursued everyone, the Israelis, back as far as Shiloh. And they may have destroyed Shiloh as the, that kind of capital city, and that they may have really done a number on Shiloh. And I'll show you why, so keep that in mind as we go on a little bit later here with this. So the scene shifts from Israel to the Philistines. So here's the Philistines. Yay, we're in Ashdod. And Ashdod was about uh, 10 or 15 miles south of the battlefield along the coastline. And Ashdod was the, the big capital of the, of the Philistines. And that's where the big temple was to Dagon. So they're bringing in the ark. Here it comes the ark. This is the, the god of the Israelis that they have conquered. And they're bringing it in, and they go into the temple of Dagon, their god, and they put the ark in front of it kind of to show a little bit of subservience, that their god is greater than the god of the Israelis that they just conquered. And everybody goes, yay, yay, we're good, they're bad, we're the winners, they're the losers, and all this other kind of stuff. Well, everybody goes to bed. When they wake up the next day, look at what's going on in verse 3 of chapter 5. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And they went, well, you know, maybe we have some earthquakes, not that big of a deal. You know, whoever was responsible for making sure Dagon was, you know, settled, they may have slacked off, fire that guy. Let's make sure that we get Dagon settled so that if we have any kind of earthquakes or anything like that, because that, that was not uncommon. Uh, Israel does have its fair share of earthquakes. In fact, the Dead Sea, I don't know if you know that, the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee along the Jordan River is a fault line. And, and that there's a lot of, I mean, it's like the San Andreas Fault in California. It's a big fault line right there. And so there's a lot of earthquakes that happen through that area. So, so they said, okay, so let's, let's put Dagon back up, and they do. And in verse 4, but when they rose early on the next morning, whoa, number 2, repeat, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the Ark of the Lord, but this time the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off from the threshold. Only, 
Wow, I haven't been keeping up with this. Here, let me, let me go back with all this and say, okay, they bring out the big gun, the Ark of the Covenant. I've got a clicker in here and I haven't been clicking here. So the, they bring out the Ark, I'm backing up, but they still lose 30,000. Hophni and Phinehas were killed. Ark was captured by the Philistines and Phinehas' wife. Okay, we did all that. So is everybody current with the graphics now? Are we good? Okay, the four people in here are nodding their head, so I'm assuming everybody at home is doing this, so that's really nice, good. Okay, so this is a, this is a depiction of what they think uh, Dagon looked like. Okay, so Dagon, the fish god, so when he fell forward, the head and the arms were kind of broken off and, and destroyed with all this, and uh, so they said, okay, this is, this is not just a, a coincidence. There's something significant going on here. And so from a spiritual perspective, they were getting a little spooked. And it says, verse 5, This is why the priest of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. To the day that this was written, that was, they seal that off. And they said, we're not stepping inside there other than to get the Ark of the Covenant out because that is now cursed. And so we're a little, we're a little spooked by all this. Verse 6, the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified them and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory surrounding. So there's tumors that are coming along with all of this. So... Um, with the tumors, there was this rat infestation. And so some people think that it might have been a type of a bubonic plague. Okay, if God wants to use that, that's fine. Doesn't matter. We just know that there is this great out, outbreaking of tumors and disease, and, and the Philistines were dying by the tens of thousands with all of this. So they got a little bit spooked with all this. And so they said... Uh, the Ark of God, verse 7, must not remain with us. So what we're going to do is let's get all the lords of the Philistines, verse 8, and said, what are we going to do? And they said, all right, well, let's, let's get it out of this town, and maybe it's localized. So they decided to move it to another town, but it didn't work because as they moved, uh, the, they moved it first to Gath, there in verse 8. But after they brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against that city, causing a very great panic. He afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so the tumors broke out on them. So they sent it to Ekron, and Ekron was another place in which uh, part of the Philistines. And they said, no, they have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us. Because word was kind of getting out that you don't want the ark in your town because it's bad things. So they decided that they would do some things about it. Now, if you look at this map, this kind of just shows just a little bit. You see Shiloh up there in the top right, and that's where the Israelis were. You see the green area. That's all the Philistines' land and, and what they have conquered. Um, the Battle of Ebenezer is straight up at the very top, or, or when, where, in Aphek, where that was. And then you see Ashdod down in, down in the far left corner. That's the seacoast town. You see the little dotted lines that go around? Those are the main uh, market roads. And you see that Ashdod's right at the conjunction of one uh, north-south and one that goes up to the north, uh, northeast with that. So Ashdod was a big trading center with all this. But Ashdod was the big center. So they sent it to Gath, and they said, well, we don't want it. And Gath said, we don't want it. So they sent it up to Ekron, and Ekron says, why are you giving it to us? We don't want it either. So, um, verse 12 the men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. And the ark of the Lord was in the country, chapter 6, verse 1. This was a seven-month time period that they kept kind of shuttling around the ark, all in Philistine area, okay, in Philistia. They finally got to the point, and they called for the priests and the diviners. Aren't, aren't they cool? The priests and, and the, the magicians. And they said, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, and we're going to send it somewhere. And basically they said, do not send it to any place in our, let's send it back, but don't send it empty. We need to do a guilt offering. Well, as far as we know, the Philistines did not engage in guilt offerings. Guilt offerings were, were Hebrew, were Israeli, because you would have an offering to God with all of this. And they said, so what's the guilt offering we should give to them? In verse 4, they say five golden tumors and five golden mice. 
Okay, well that's interesting, you know, and the reason that they were doing five was because there were five major leaders in five major cities uh, within Philistia that, um, that these guys got together. Remember earlier when, they, when all the lords got together, what do we do? There were five of them. So what they basically did and said, let's do one for, let's, let's do, um, one for each town and one for each uh, leader with all this. And we're going to make tumors, which, you know, I, I'm not sure how you would make a golden tumor other than maybe just getting gold and dumping it in sand and letting it just kind of look like that. Because I don't know what a tumor looks like. I mean, how would you mold a tumor? Now, a mouse or a rat, yeah, we could figure that out. You know, you got the ears and you got the little things going on with that. So yeah, you could you can make a little mouse, a golden mouse with that. And you could say, yeah, that looks like a mouse. I don't know if you'd look at the golden tumor and said, hey, that looks like a golden tumor. No, it looks just like a plop of whatever it is. Regardless, they said, let's get these together. Let's put them in their own separate box. Let's get a cart, a brand new cart, fresh wood. Let's get two oxen, brand new oxen um, that, that have not yet uh, weaned their calves and that are you know, new and pristine and, and unblemished. And let's put all this on the cart and we're gonna take it to a crossroads. And we're gonna take it to a crossroads. Now, remember they're in Ekron right now. Here's the map again. You see Ekron in the green? And they said, let's just put it on a road and let's get, go hia. And if it moves back toward Philistine area, we know that God is not through with us yet. But if it moves toward the Israeli area, then we know that God might be through with us and he's willing to accept uh, the sacrifice. So that's pretty much what they did. They put all this stuff on the cart, the, the ark, and the, um, the, the, the gold, and, and the oxen, and they got this, and it ended up going to Beth Shemesh. And let me show you again. Beth Shemesh, you see it's right across the border, just straight across to the east. And that's where the oxen went, okay? So when it went to Beth Shemesh, it got there. Now, one of the things about Beth Shemesh is that when you go back in the book of Joshua, when they were setting up the land, there were some places that Levites could have donated land within different areas. Well, Beth Shemesh was one of those Levitical cities. So there was a bunch of Levites there, so it was good for it to go there, and everybody kind of got there. But when it got there, everybody was, was excited. And look there in uh, verse 13. People of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat har harvest in the valley. They lifted up their eyes. They saw the ark. They rejoiced. Yay! Here comes the ark. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there. They split up the wood of the cart, offered the cows as a burnt offering for the Lord. Levites took down the ark of the Lord, remember by the handles, and the box that was beside it that had the gold, and they set them on this great stone that's there. They had this great sacrifice. And the Philistines had spies, and they said, okay, good. When they saw it, they returned that day to Ekron, saying, yea, us, let's good riddance. And these are the golden tumors of the Philistines, one for Ashdod, uh, Geza, uh, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. The golden mice, according to the number of cities, and these types of things. Very interesting thing here that's going on is that while it was in Beth Shemesh, the scripture says this, Verse 19, and he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them, is one version. Some says 70 men, 50,000, which may, may mean one man for every 5,000 or something. And the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with such a great blow. Now, I don't think that when it says looked upon, that that means they cracked the lid of the ark to see what was inside. Because you remember, if anybody touches the ark, it, they die. And I don't think that means that they got, you know, a crowbar and pried open the lid to see what was on the ark. I don't think this had anything to do with what they were doing looking inside the ark. The scripture here says they looked upon and looked upon that Hebrew word. Um, the, the basically means it's an attitude. They, they had pride. They had arrogance. They almost had a Nah, nah, 
kind of an attitude, kind of a we're better than you are. See what our ark did to you guys. See, you shouldn't have taken our ark in the first place. This is our ark. You know, we're God's chosen people. You don't mess with God's chosen people. You don't mess with the ark. Not a good idea. So I think the scriptures inferring that there was this haughtiness and arrogance, which was still a carryover from the battle. You know, the arrogance of the people to go into battle without asking God, I think that was all similar with all that. So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath Jerem, which is about uh, 10 miles north, and they said, all right, so let's, let's move it there. So they put it on a, a, a cart and they moved it up to kiriath Jerem, which is about 10 miles north, on its way to Shiloh, but it ended up staying there for about 20 years. Now, this is a picture of the archaeological dig at, Beth, at, at Kiriath Jerem, and they think they found the place, and this is the place where the ark stayed for, for 20 years. That's what they think, because it's, it's significant, it's different the way it's, it's built and everything like that, and it's from that era. So I thought this was an interesting slide to see with all this. So it stayed there, and it stayed there, in verse, chapter 7, verse, uh, verse 2, for 20 years. Well, why didn't they take it all the way back to Shiloh? Because I think Shiloh was wiped out by the Philistines. I, or, or the Shiloh as they knew it was, was not a, a place. And so they kept it there at, uh, at uh, Kiriath Jerem there for 20 years. And from that day, a long time past 20 years, Israel lamented this. Verse 3, there of chapter 7, Samuel said, If you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, now remember this is 20 years, so Samuel is probably in his mid to late 30s by now. And we don't have anything going, what was Samuel doing during those 20 years? We don't know. Those are kind of the quiet years. But we do know that he, he says, if you want to turn away, or turn toward God, then verse 4, chapter 8, or 7, put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, serve the Lord only, and they did that. And they gathered, gathered at a place called Mizpah, which was east of kiriath Jerem and between Shiloh and Jerusalem. So it's a little bit further in, in the land, and they were doing that. And I will pray for you. So they gathered, verse 6, at Mizpah, and they fasted and they feasted, and Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. But, but, the Philistines got a little spooked by all this. And now remember, this is 20 years down the road. They got a little spooked by this gathering of all the nation of Israel, and they said, okay, this is not going to be good. So the Philistines gathered, uh, and they went to war against uh, Israel, and the people of Israel heard it in verse 7. They were afraid. Samuel said, do not cease to cry out to the Lord that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel offered a sacrifice, appealed to God. Verse 10, the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines, threw them into confusion. They were defeated before Israel. And the men went out from Mizpah, pursued the Philistines, and struck them as far as below beth Car. And they ended up taking a lot of the Philistines' land. And this is where... We sing this song, you know, here I raise my Ebenezer. The Ebenezer stone was put up between Mizpah and Shin and called that name Ebenezer, for he said, till now the Lord has helped us. And anecdotally, there's a stone, that's, this stone is in that land that they kind of think might be the stone that Samuel put up. We don't know, you know, did George Washington really sleep here? Maybe, I don't know. But there is a stone in the plain, geographically about the same, that's this stone. And some people say, this is the Ebenezer with all of this. So the Philistines were subdued in verse 13, did not enter the territory. Again, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, including Shiloh, I believe, from Ekron to Gath which is Philistine area. Israel delivered the territory from the hands of the Philistines. In verse 15, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went around doing all of the prophesying and building people up. And in verse 17, it says, he would remain, return to Ramah, his hometown, not Shiloh, and from Ramah he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. 
Okay? So that's, that's what's going on with all that. So that's the story of the ark. So are there going to be a little bit of lessons that might be take away? Yes. Number one, God is going to fulfill his promises. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Now, he may not do it today, he may not do it tomorrow, and he may not do it in the way in which I think he ought to. But God will honor his promises, and we see in that scripture that God did. Number two, try to do it better than the Israelis did at the front end of this. The Israelis did not seek out God before they made plans. Be sure to appeal to God for your plans. Remember, even Jesus in the, wilderness, or in the garden, when he was um, agonizing, he says, let this cup pass from me. I, here's what I want. But then again, it's not my will, it's your will. And that's not a bad formula. God, we want to defeat the Philistines. But it's not what we want, it's what you want for us. That's what they forgot. And that's what I think we can remember. Commit your plans to the Lord. Number three, don't expect God to bail you out of your own poor decision making. Don't blame God if you do something and it causes problems and you say, well, God didn't protect me. Well, I don't know if God is obligated to protect you if, and I'm saying you generic, and I'll include me, if, if we have a mindset of arrogance and haughtiness that I think I want to do what I want to do, and because I love God and God loves me, he's going to bless all of my decisions? No, 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 no. Everything needs to function through the will of God, and sometimes that means my inconvenience. So don't always expect God that when I decide to do something that I think is really smart and clever, that God is automatically going to go along with it and say, okay, no, there's going to be penalties. And the penalties we had here were tens of thousands of Israelis that were killed and tens of thousands of families that were devastated by that because they did not seek out God. Number four, Follow God's rules always. If God says, give honor to me, then be sure you give honor to me. If God says, go over here, then go over here. Whatever God's rules are about the ark, about worship, all of these things from this story, if God has rules to them, follow the rules for what they are. And then number five, I think is a very interesting thing. And we do this, but I don't know if we do it for this reason. So I'm going to give you a reason. You collect pictures, and you go on a trip, and you collect trophies and, and baubles and memorabilia, and you put them on your mantelpiece, and you put them on your bookshelf, and you look at them, and it reminds you of something that was really neat and amazing. I want you to understand, this is a gift from God, our memory. And when we set up our own stones of remembrance, I think it helps the connection of what happened back then and how the hand of God has been with me all through this time. So I'm not suggesting that you build altars, okay? I'm not suggesting you go in your backyard and put up a big stone and say, that's my Ebenezer, what do you guys think? You like it? Yeah, got it from Home Depot. No, I don't think that's the point. I think the thing is, is that when God does some things that are memorable in our lives, find a way to, to remember and not to forget. Because every time the Israelis would go by that stone Ebenezer, it gave them an opportunity to once again tell the story of their faithlessness and the punishment and the decision of God and their faithfulness when they turned their hearts to God about how God would work with them. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson, and if you would read chapters 8, 9, and 10 in 1 Samuel for next week, uh, we will kind of wrap up this year's study uh, with those readings. All right? Y'all have a good rest of the day. Hope to see many of y'all in worship this morning.